Okay. Well, welcome back to our Bible study here at Prince of Peace in Spring Lake Park. We're in Luke chapter 8. I should put that up on the board so you can take a look at that and see. And uh, we'll start this morning with uh, questions about our breakfast Bible study, which we had yesterday. Yesterday we had uh, the Reverend Thomas Quack come down and, and uh, teach a Bible study on sanctification. Um, and he spoke about sanctification for about an hour, a little bit over an hour here. We had a really nice turnout for that Bible study. And so certainly there are questions that remain from that Bible study. Um, and then, of course, we have the sermon from this morning and the readings. So if there's any questions uh, from those uh, presentations, uh, before we jump into Luke 8, and we'll be at Luke 8, um, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verses, or verse 16 is where we'll, where we'll begin. Yeah, Sue. Right. Because he was talking all about the mirror. Right. And that made sense. Right. But the third use of the rule, how does that tie into the second use? Okay. So Sue uh, Sue is asking about uh, the second and the third use of the law. The second use, we talk about three uses of the law, the first being the curb, and that is the use of law by governments to keep everybody kind of from killing each other. It's not perfect but it allows us to live in a society and not go around stealing everybody's stuff and having our stuff being stolen. And uh, that's that law as a curb. And uh, it has nothing to do with your salvation. It has, no, it has everything to do with civil righteousness. It has everything to do with living in the world. The law is curb. Think here of the traffic laws. The traffic laws are, are, many of them are simply random, aren't they? Why do we have to drive 30 instead of 35 or or 30 instead of 31. Uh, this highway is 55. We have all these different traffic laws when you come to a, uh, a stop sign, uh, and we hope that people follow them. <laughs> but it's interesting how it works. It's interesting that we don't have a thousand crashes every morning during traffic. And, and, I mean, that everybody's following the set of rules in their head that they've learned, and we hurl ourselves down the road at 75 miles an hour and because we're all kind of following, in general, the basic same ideas, we get along, we get to work okay, and everything's fine. That's kind of the law as curb, all right? And then when we don't follow that law, we get in accidents, and, and we get tickets, and that type of thing. Uh, the mirror, of course, is the theological, and we call that the political use of the law, the law for the city, the law for the polis. You know, the, that's where we get all those uh, political ideas. The Greek term polis, P-O-L-I-S. Uh, of course, in Greek, not in English. Um, but this is where we get the term polis, or political. And that in Greek, it's, this means city. That's what that term means, city. The polis, all right? And that's the political use of the law, uh, to allow us to live together. It's like when you go to summer camp, and the first thing you do at summer camp is they lay down the rules. You know, the first afternoon you're there, here are the rules. You go to school, every class you go into, you know, the, the teacher hands you a piece of paper, you go to college, here are the rules. Here's how you're going to get an A, here's how you're going to get a B. Here's your... Every class they do the same thing. And the rules aren't always the same. Some classes it might be you have to attend. Other classes it might be you don't have to attend, just make sure you pass the final. Different rules for different situations. This is the law as the curb. The law as the mirror is a theological use. And that is it shows us our sins. And that's the chief use of the law. That it shows that, you know, here's, here's how you are. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, one of my favorite cartoons growing up, because I think I was a lot like Calvin there. And, um, you know, every once in a while, Calvin would get mad at Hobbes, and he'd say, this is how you are, and he'd make a face, and Hobbes would go, this is how you are, and they'd go back and forth, you know, making faces at each other. And that's what the mirror does. The mirror says, this is how you are. And I really like Pastor Quack's idea yesterday where he said, you know, people try to fix the law by, by fixing the mirror <laughs> instead of fixing their face. You know, I thought that was a great idea. That, you know, they, they put makeup on the mirror to make the face in the mirror look better, and then they walk away from the mirror and, wait, wait a second, they haven't changed at all. And uh, by trying to change the law. That's a theological use. It shows us our sin. That's the convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment from John 16 that we talked about this morning in the Revelation Bible study. Um, now, the third use is called the rule. Uh, the, and that is, what do we do? And, and, and the whole idea here simply is um, that 
even if we were sinless, we wouldn't be all-knowing. Okay? If we didn't have sin, we wouldn't know everything. I mean, we sometimes think that. We think that, well, if we had no sin, we'd know everything. And we'd always know what to do all the time. Where in reality, when, even if we didn't have sin, we'd still have to ask, what should I do here? Okay? That's how you have to think about it. And so then the law is not a, uh, a, something that is pounding us. It's, it's simply, oh, what should I do? Because, and the question, and this is, he didn't cover this too much yesterday. Not at all, I think. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Um, and that is the law is a description of love. And so when we ask, what should we do? We're asking, how do I love somebody in this situation, Right? And we don't know that. And, and, and even if we were sinless, we wouldn't know it. We don't become God and become omniscient and all-powerful, omnipotent, and certainly not omnipresent if we, when we become sinless. So we can ask and say, how should we do this? And then we're told, and then we're like, thank you. I didn't know how to do this. Kind of like when sometimes we're that way where we just want to learn and we ask somebody and they teach us and we're like, wow, now we know. That's awesome. I watched this one uh, lady on YouTube. Her name is Blondie Hack. She's a Canadian engineer, and she makes these incredible, these just amazing videos on how to make parts and stuff using your machines. And they're always so informative. They're always so well done. There's humor. There's all these types of things. And I don't know why she does it, but they're just amazingly good. And you're like, wow, I don't know any of this stuff. And she, and she teaches you how to do it. And we've all run across YouTube videos like that. That's how we have to think about the law in the third use. That is where we're like, well, what do we do? Okay, this is what we do. And that's only for Christians. The third use of the law is only for Christians. Okay? Uh, the first use and the second use are for everybody. The third use is only for Christians. Okay? Yeah. It's kind of like when John the Baptist was preaching and, and, and the people said, what should we do? You know, the soldiers said, what should we do? Uh, the tax collector said, what should we do? And John gave a different answer to each one, right? They want to do it, but they just don't know what, okay? And that's where learning comes in. That's where, if you go back to Proverbs, you know, Proverbs is a good book to learn the third use of the law. Or, you know, you go, well, how do I live? How do I address this situation, okay? Now, there are some that teach, well, no, no, once you become a Christian, you just instinctively know. Well, in many cases, that's true because you've just gotten rid of the sin but in other cases, you don't. In other cases, you're like, well, I don't know what to do here, but I know that God does, so I'll just ask, you know, I'll, I'll consult his word, and then I'll know. Okay? But there are even some moments in your life where the right answer you don't know. You know, the, the classic is, should you pray for someone to stay alive or pray for them to die? You know, when someone you love is dying. Are you praying for them to... I mean, how many people pray for grandma to keep living but then feel guilty because they're being selfish because they see that grandma's suffering so much and so they're well I want grandma to completely recover and well yeah don't we all but grandma's 127 years old okay so maybe the better prayer might be Lord let at last your angels come to Abram's bosom take me home take her home that she might die unfearing that might be a better prayer okay that's a classic example of that all right, good. Good question there, Sue. Anything else? Anything else? He covered a lot of stuff yesterday. Hmm. Can I ask you uh, silly questions? Okay, silly questions. We do allow one silly question a uh, Bible study. Perfect, and I'll use it on this one. <laughs> uh, so prior to the fall of man, was that not, I mean, was that Adam practically that the Garden of Eden? Okay. Right. Okay, that's a wonderful question. Uh, um, Sam asked, prior to the fall, uh, was the Garden of Eden heaven? And I think it's a great idea, because uh, as Pastor Quack noted yesterday, if they had never sinned, they never would die. And, you know, because the number one reason we know that we all still have sin is because we die. And that's the number one reason why Christians still need the law, as well as the gospel, of course, is because we die. We still have sin. That's the evidence right there. Because the only reason we die is because of sin. That's the only reason. We don't die because of any other reason. We die because of sin. 
that's it. Now there are secondary causes, heart attack, stroke, disease, whatever, but the primary cause is sin. That's it. Um, Revelation talks about a new heaven and a new earth. So does, does the Garden of Eden simply just continue to be this heavenly existence? And I would say yes, because there's no reason for it not to be. What uh, sin spreads because of the sin of Adam and Eve, and it spreads to mankind. We have the killing of Cain and Abel. We have, or the Cain, killing of, of Abel by Cain. We have the animals that uh, take on sinful activities. Um, you know, we have this moment in Genesis where God is sorry that he made man because he said what? The thoughts of his heart are con evil continually. And that then transfers into the, uh, how we treat animals and then how animals treat one another. You know, originally the animals didn't eat each other. The animals ate plants just like everybody else. And, I, and I've said this before, but one of the most impressive things I've ever seen is a grizzly bear um, in Alaska digging for grubs to eat. You know, because you always think of the grizzly bear walking around killing, you know, caribou and moose and then coming after backpackers and then, you know, just, just maiming and killing. But in reality, most of their diet is they're sitting there digging all day. I mean, the, the uh, black bears up in the Rockies, they go up into the rocks above the tree line and they eat moths. You're like, what, bears eat moths? Yeah, they spend one of, one of the parts of the spring, they're up there eating moths. And they do it every year. They couldn't figure out what they were doing up there until they finally were watching them and they figured out they, they just love these moths and they just dig around and go after moths. What, they're bears, they're car carnivores, they're supposed to eat meat, that's all they do. No, actually, most of what they eat is nothing like that. So man's sin then is transferred to animals and, and of course after the, uh, after the flood, specifically, God gives man the authority to eat animals where he didn't have it before. And basically what it says there in Genesis is now you can eat the animals, but they're not going to like it. <laughs> and, and of course, then, so we have this, this horrible thing going on where no animal dies of old age unless mankind intervenes. Mankind intervenes and our pets die of old age and our pet bird dies of old age and our pet fish dies of old age. But if we left those animals out in the wilderness, as soon as they got slow, boy, there'd be, be munch food, lunch for everything else. And so when we look out in the, the world at the, all the animals around us, it's a vicious, vicious, horrible place for them. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that the animals have to live in fear that they're going to get eaten. But they are. I mean, we've all seen the, the, the ducks, you know, the mama duck, and, the, and they're going, and all the little baby ducks, you know, in, in the spring, and by the end of the summer, there's one. You know, but initially, there's ten. What happened to the other nine? Oh, well, they just rebelled and went, <laughs> no, one was munched by a turtle, another one, you know, another couple raccoons got, a couple got smashed by cars, one was eaten by a hawk. Well, wow, that's a wonderful existence. But Luther pointed that out. He said, you know, the animals look at us and say, boy, you, you got it great. You build these houses and you have walls around your cities and you can dwell in security. And we live every moment thinking that we're just going to be destroyed. And so that's the effect of sin too. And if you go out west and if you look at the, the mountains in a new way, especially if you go through Wyoming, all of what you see out there is a result of sin. And that is the, the, the reaction of God to sin was the flood. And when you look out west, the utter bareness and the majesty and the, uh, the, just the scarring is all because of the flood. Because before the flood, that area was a tropical paradise. And we know that because of the, the um, uh, fossils that we find out there. You go to Kemmer, Wyoming. It's one of the most, wor the, the, you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's in western, southwestern Wyoming. And it's just this bare spot, but they find hundreds of thousands of stuff. I mean, it's just so much that they chisel out with air hammers. And it's palm trees, and it's gigantic alligators, and it's tropical fish, and it's all of that. In western Wyoming, so the effect of sin on creation, you could also say like the Gobi Desert, uh, any inhospitable place on earth, you can blame on the flood. God's effect. Now we look at it, it's, oh, this is starkly beautiful, which it still is. It still is. 
but initially it wasn't. Initially it was like uh, you know, the equator covered with, I mean, where do all the fossil fuels come from? Think of that. Why do they call them fossil fuels? Because it's all the leftovers from the flood being compressed underground, smushed at great temperatures and turned into oil or coal. And coal, you can still see the tree bark often with the coal. If you, if, I mean, you, Alaska's a great place for this because everywhere you go in Alaska, it's just this rugged beauty and you're like, wow, look at this. But it's all the effect of the flood, the effect of sin. So the fact that if we remove sin, um, what the earth would be would be even more incredible and wonderful, heavenly in existence. And as I'm getting older, I'm thinking, you know, the new heaven and the new earth, that sounds right, right? Because the initial creation was this garden in which man was placed. And here we might want to say that the Jehovah's Witnesses are probably right about that. Because that's what they teach. They teach it's, they just don't teach uh, that you get there in the right way. But they do teach more, they lean more towards the new heaven and new earth than they do the heavenly somewhere out somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place, that type of idea, okay? But there's enough evidence on both sides. But, you know, why, why wouldn't it be a new heaven and a new earth? Because take away sin from man, and we're pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what, I mean, just take a look at any incredibly skilled human being, whether they're, you know, football players, ballet dancers, pianists, artists, and they do these incredible things and it just blows you away that a human being can do that, you know? And you're just like, wow, that is just utterly incredible. And, and I mean, any large opera that blows our mind or, or, you know, a huge piece of architecture that you just kind of go, it's unbelievable. And, and you see the divine, the divine, what they, the enlightenment called the divine spark in man, but, the fact that man is made in the image of God and in the image of God he creates and he creates and he and initially he creates beauty and 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 a lot of people still strive to create beauty and why why do we create beauty that's an interesting question so yeah it's all connected so I, I tend to think that more along your lines that new heaven and new earth everything will be restored and we'll get to experience the earth like Adam and Eve you know, in the sense of just this incredible creation that we live in. But certainly there's plenty of evidence that, that um, no, it's not going to be the earth, but it's going to be this incredible place. But there's still going to be plants there, there's going to be animals there, there's going to be, I mean, Revelation talks about trees in heaven that bear fruit. And you think, well, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. It's, well, wait a second, there's no sin in a tree. And here we have to get our minds out of this whole mindset of thinking material, sinful, spiritual, good. Oh, wait a second. What about the demons? Okay, spiritual, not necessarily good. <laughs> because we think of material usage. But I mean, that's an old Greek idea, isn't it? The old, I forget which philosophy it was, but uh, Augustine got into that for a while. And that's the idea that anything material is bad, anything spiritual is good. And that was a, that was a common Greek philosophy that, that existed for a couple hundred years. And, and we have to say, no, not all spiritual things are, are good. There, some are bad. But the creation itself, the only thing that makes the creation bad is man's usage of it. But otherwise, it's incredibly wonderful. It's amazingly awesome. And if you do any creating or making, what do they call on the Internet? Content creators, right? That's kind of interesting they call them that. But that's what they call them, right? Hmm. Nice silly question there, Sam. Way to go. I was laughing all the way. <laughs> all right. Parable of the Lamp, 16, 17, 18. Now we're Luke 8, verse 16. No one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed. And he puts it on a lamp, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come, it may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Um, it's all complex stuff here. It's not so easy to grasp, is it? 
I mean, we understand, okay, you turn on a light, and why would you turn on a light? I do that every once in a while. I'll have a, a, a flashlight on, and I'll just stick it on the table like this and not turn it off. And then I'll come back like a half an hour later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we do that with our cell phones too, right? We turn on the flashlight, and then we forget that we've turned on the flashlight, and then we walk down the street, and there's this light in our pants. You know, everybody, hey, your flashlight's on. And um, we do that. At least I do. Um, so if we turn on a light, it's to lighten things and to see something. Some people don't want to come to church because they don't want to be in the light. Let's just be honest. They don't want to be exposed to the light. They don't want to see themselves. They, they kind of think that they're okay. And if they come to church, they might be exposed for who they are, so they don't come. They don't want to step into the light. Okay? Okay. So, for nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will be known and come to light. This is a pretty, pretty uh, profound idea that is uh, part of Christianity, and that is that God knows everything. And that we, as people, are not living secretly. And the secrets of our heart, the secret of our mind, the secrets of our souls are not secrets to God. They're not secrets to God. And that we are living in his presence and he knows everything about us. You know, even the hairs of our head, so Jesus says, are numbered, right? He knows everything. And so as Christians, uh, we realize that we're kind of at a disadvantage to begin with. <laughs> Meaning that God knows everything about us. So why should we come and lie to him? Why should we come and, and kind of act like he doesn't know what we're doing, Right? It's kind of like uh, when cell phones came out and the kids in confirmation class would play with their cell phones under the table as if I didn't know. <laughs> you, know you know, they're, they're you know, under the, you know, it's like, really? <laughs> but somehow they thought, well, Pastor Strawn, you know, he's a dinosaur. He doesn't know what a cell phone is. So I'll just play on my cell phone during confirmation class. You know, they're only 10 feet away from me. <laughs> Got to be more clever than that. Uh, but that's what we do with God. Like, oh, he doesn't know I'm doing this. He doesn't know I'm doing this to my body. He doesn't know I'm doing this at two in the morning. How doesn't he know? That's dark. God can't see through the dark. He'd need those, like, those goggles like the military has. And then he might be able to see. But I'm going to put this coat on so that he can't see my body. That's so stupid. Man exists in this gigantic lie. God doesn't know what I'm doing. Yes, he does. And then at Christmas, we sing about Santa... He knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you are awake. Santa does, but God doesn't. Apparently so. According to the world. You take things too seriously, Pastor. No. <laughs> I think we need a little bit more seriousness in the world. Um, so, but I mean, that's an important concept there. You're not hiding anything to God. You're not hiding anything from God. If people realized it, um, they'd be in church. So take care how you listen. This is probably a big thing for today, right? You've, you've got, I mean, I think we need a, a, a check here on who we listen to and how we listen to them and how, how much we listen to them. I mean, how long do you spend on the internet? How long do you spend watching television? How long, I mean, it used to be we had two sources of media, right? Three. Well, we had newspapers, you have to sit down, and you have to sit there and read it, and you'd page through those. Television, right? Click it on, watch it for half an hour. And you'd have the radio, too. You'd turn on the radio, and that was it. Well, we've got those three still, plus everything online. And how is it that we listen to these things? And on what basis do we listen to them? You know, this whole idea of being in the kingdom of Jesus is a wonderful idea for us. And I think that's where we need to start. The idea that we also are the anointed ones of God existing in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I think that's where we need to begin. And how are we informed by that? We are informed by that um, by the very word of God, which we read and learn and inwardly digest. Well, then how do we think about the world? Well, here's an idea for you. When you went to school, when you went to college, when you went to anywhere, did you really care about everybody around you? I mean, think of that. You had your assignments, you'd go to class, and you'd walk by hundreds, if not thousands, of students. 
um, every single day on the way to class. Now, what if you had stopped every day and talked to each and every one of those students? You'd never get anywhere. You'd never get anywhere. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but boy, you'd be shaped and formed in a different way than if you went to class and just listened in class. Now, what I'm suggesting is that the class is the Word of God, and then we can see everyone else around us within the context of that Word and who we are as redeemed. Because if we get back to your silly question, Sam, and that is, if heaven is earth without sin, then the kingdom of God on earth through the proclamation of the Word is incredibly in play. Mean it, meaning it exists and we are part of it and the reality is that this is incredibly important what is happening right here right now as to how we understand ourselves how we understand the world how we understand who we are in the world you know it's so it's so easy it's so easy to say to develop ourselves in this way and that is to say okay let's start down here at the bottom and say, well, I'm the child of my parents, not anybody else. Your kids hate that when you point it out to them. <laughs> you know, if I hadn't met your mom, you wouldn't exist. <laughs> it's, a philosoph it's a philosophical conundrum. It's like, well, yeah, we, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, no, you wouldn't. You would not exist. Uh, uh. <laughs> okay, you are the child of your parents. And then, Okay, you're in a nation, and uh, you're in a language, you have a language, and you live in a region, and then you're in that region, you're in a society, whatever that society is, and then you receive an education, no matter what that education is, and then you have ideas. And then it's very easy to think, well then, yeah, I also have Jesus. <laughs> I have faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. And we let all of these things inform that faith. Instead of beginning here, child of God. And you become a child of God through your baptism. You become reborn into the kingdom of God. And so that what does that mean? It means that all the rest of these things have to be taken in context of you being a children of God, a child of God in the kingdom of God. That's what that means. When you were baptized into Christ, it flipped everything upside down. So that means everything else here then is informed by the fact that you're a Christian and that you're a child of God, that God is your father, Jesus is your brother. Okay? Everything else. And that helps you understand and cope with all of this, and we're going to get right to it here in our next little section here in Luke. The same idea. And you know, you're just being radical, Pastor. I'm just going off of Sam's silly question. That's all I'm doing, so blame him. Your fault. You hadn't brought up the question. Because, look at the next three verses. And his mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So who are my mother and my brothers? He's saying, when you're in the kingdom of God, you're in the kingdom of God. Why can't we have a Christian conspiracy theory? <laughs> have you heard? There's all these people that have this king. Really? Yeah, and they gather once a week to hear about the king. Oh, really? What's he going to do? He's going to come back and he's going to take over the whole place. Really? He's going to come back and take over the whole place? Yeah! Not just the, the U.S., the entire world! No way. Yeah, I've heard about it. Have you seen the, seen the websites? Oh, yeah, I've got them on the email list. It tells me whenever anything important happens. Well, how do you learn about it? Well, we've got this book. This book tells you all about that kingdom. 
Ooh, are we allowed to read it? Yeah. Wow. Hmm, how can I get a copy? Hey, suddenly, Christianity sounds pretty fun. <laughs> it's like, we're part of the great conspiracy theory. <laughs> but that's what's happening. And I don't know if I, I just had wonderful parents that, that uh, always kind of saw our, you know, saw our life that way, but I think that's true. And, and, it, you know, I, and I don't want to pull out the pastor's kid card here, but why not? <laughs> when you live in a parsonage growing up, you have a different view of the world. Because you sit there and say, this isn't our house. Can we paint the room? No, it doesn't belong to us. Can we put a basketball? We had a big thing at our one parsonage. We wanted a basketball hoop, but the trustees wouldn't let us put the basketball hoop on the parsonage. I know, it was early 70s. It's like, family with three boys, no basketball hoop. What is this place? <laughs> so we go across the street. And we shoot baskets over there <laughs> at the Parnells, and they had an 11 foot basket. They put a basket at 11 feet. Who does that? Um, it wasn't very, I was gonna say, it wasn't very helpful. <laughs> but I remember heaving the ball up, both hands trying to get it through the hoop. And, um, but you get this idea that you know, you're serving God, and so this, this place you're living, it doesn't really matter in the sense of. Uh, you have to be a good steward of it. It's not your house. You live in the house for as long as your dad is a pastor there. And when he takes a call and goes somewhere else, you go and live in a different house. And, you know, military kids have the same experience. Um, and the, uh, but, the, but that philosophy that, well, okay, we're just strangers here. Heaven is our home. And it, it's an interesting thought that you grow up with. That, well, yeah, you just live there for a while and then you, you move somewhere else. You're not tied into one community, too. You don't say, well, we grew up here, so we're going to stay here forever. No, that doesn't happen when you're a pastor's kid. You know, I mean, I, 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 I was born in Fremont, Nebraska. We lived in Scribner. I don't remember that. And then we moved to Gehring, Nebraska. And then we moved to Loveland, Colorado. And then when I was in Germany, my parents moved, went to Broken Bow, Nebraska. And my, my siblings remember Kadoka, South Dakota. And my oldest brother was born on Vicarage in Ohio. And that's our family too. You know, the kids are born all over the country. Where were you born? My claim to fame is I was the only kid born in Nebraska because my siblings were born in Ohio, South Dakota, and then Colorado, and I was the only Nebraskan. Um, and I guess that's infamous. That could be infamous, or, or I don't know what that is. But you grow up with a different idea that, you know, you don't have this idea of hometown because you don't have one. And, and you've had that experience. I mean, you've had that experience as well. But then that should allow you to understand this better. You're a child of God. God's going to take care of you wherever you are, and he's going to provide parents and friends and family and all the things you need wherever you are. That's it. So look at this. His mother and brothers came to him. So one of the texts that we looked at to, uh, to assert that Jesus did have brothers. Okay? And, you know, the, the theory is, of course, that, um, that these are younger brothers of Jesus. They're not older brothers. But, of course, the Roman Catholic position is that Joseph had brothers by another wife before Mary was, before Joseph married. And so Joseph's first wife um, died. And so then when Mary married Joseph, um, Joseph had kids already, but of course, what happened to those kids when Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem and then they went to Egypt and back to Nazareth? You know, that's a good four years there, four or five years. Well, their relatives were taking care of them. Um, it would seem that after um, the birth of Jesus that Mary had more kids by Joseph. Okay? And of course, John, we, in the Gospel of John, we have a conversation between Jesus and his brothers because they're the ones that say, well, go up to Jerusalem and show them how great you are because they didn't believe in him. Which goes to show you, that sounds more like brothers than anything. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Melissa? <laughs> you're nothing. <laughs> Why? Because you're our sibling and we can't let you, we can't compliment you in any way. <laughs> because then you might have political power over us within the family. <laughs> How did I come up with that? Um, 
So 18, so take care how you listen for whoever has to him more shall be given and whoever does not have even what he th thinks he has shall be taken away. You know, we can see that in general life. The people who are more responsible, responsible usually have more responsibilities. You know, if you've ever met somebody who's, who's a millionaire, they are incredibly responsible people and they are continually busy 16, 18 hours a day. And to, to some extent, that's how they got their millions, but it's also, um, they sh they've shown great responsibility. And then you have other people that have, you know, are gifted maybe a family farm or their, uh, a family house or something. And what happens? They, don't even, they can't even take care of it. They don't take care of it and it falls into ruins, right? Because they don't want to take, they don't want to take responsibility for it. They, and they don't. This is generally true, isn't it? I mean, I used to get so sick um, when I'd see a talented musician, like in college, we had a number of talented musicians that never practiced. Um, or weren't interested in music at all, but they had this talent that I just, I coveted. I'll just say that. And I was a teenage coveter. I was a teenage coveter. Isn't that what those witch trials were about? No, that's a different thing. I was a teenage <laughs> coveter. And you're like, well, if you just practice a little bit, you'd be on. I don't like music. I don't like, and, um, and same thing in athletics. You'd, you'd see somebody who was so good at what they did and um, they, wouldn't, they, they couldn't take a coach telling them, you know, try this. And so they couldn't play because they couldn't play in a team, because they were so good um, you know, that they didn't want anybody telling them what to do. And so eventually they couldn't express their skills and their skills went away, all right? So this is generally true. Uh, to those who have, more will be given. To those who have, even that will be taken away. And you look around in life and that's exactly right. I mean, you know, I know there's not a lot of Brady lovers out there, but you look at Tom Brady and, you know, not a great moral example to the world. But from what they say, he exercises all year, he watches his diet all year, he does all his homework, obviously, as he plays. And at the age of, what, 43, 44, he's still out there throwing the football around with the best of them. And, you know, when, no matter what you <laughs> think of him, you look at it and say, that's pretty impressive. And he doesn't have to either. I mean, he's got millions of reasons. <laughs> not to have to do that. I mean, he could have long ago, long ago gone down to Florida and retired and said, I'm good, and, and people would have just, all he had to do the rest of his life is show up. But he still plays. And you're like, well, something's driving him. I don't know. But certainly what he's been given, he's made the most of because he's never had a great arm. He's never, but he's got a brain, and you can see, certainly see that. And he seems to use that to the greatest, his greatest ability because he just seems to, be able just to pick things apart. Pretty impressive. Even if you don't like him. You don't like him. Well, I mean, you have to be able just to, to compliment people and say, it's like, well, Genghis Khan, he was horrible. Yeah, but brilliant. He was brilliantly horrible. So was Alexander the Great. I mean, that's why he's called Alexander the Great, not Alexander the Pretty Good. <laughs> that was his younger brother. Um, okay. Questions here? There's a lot there. It's true. So, now on those days, Jesus and his disciples, verse 22, now on those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they were talking about the Sea of Galilee. The only sea, there's only two sea, well, three. Then only two play a huge role and one is usually the case. So anytime you see sea in the Bible, we're usually talking Sea of Galilee. Okay. Um, Red Sea when it comes to the Exodus, right? But that's the only time we really run into that. Mediterranean when we talk about um, Tyre and Sidon. Perhaps um, Jonah, right? But otherwise, anytime you see a sea, see a galley. That's what we're talking about, all right? So let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they launch down. You have to think of a lax here. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Okay, questions here?
How does he stay asleep when it's raining? Did uh, Sue asked, did, he ex- did Jesus expect them to think this is normal? That's a good question. That he could just handle it. Yeah, I mean, he, he rebuked them, but was he really... So he was being unfair? What? Jesus was expecting more from them than he should have. Yeah. Ah, yeah, it's, it's all Jesus' fault, right, Sue? It wasn't the disciples' fault, it was Jesus' fault. Bar's too high. Bar's too high. <laughs> Okay, so Marv says... By the fact that when he calmed the wind, and they were, as in the Bible says, they were amazed. Yeah. Even the wind um, listened to him. Yeah. So Marv's saying they just hadn't, they they had begun to believe, but they just didn't have enough evidence to, to kind of figure out exactly what was going on yet. Yeah, I would think that was pretty good. Um, What's that? I'm off the hook. You're off the hook, Sue. You're off the hook. (laughs) <laughs> I, I mean, it's very interesting you know they did find a um, they did find a boat here back in what the 1990s because the um, Sea of Galilee went through a drought and it went down about 50 or 100 feet and one of these boats emerged from the water and you can visit it there apparently if you go to the Holy Land now next to the Sea of Galilee there's a and it's still in a water tank but it shows that a boat that's um, it's a small boat, but I mean, you got your disciples in it, so it's got to be 13, 14 people, right, in a boat, so nothing too small. But the boat is like this, and there's a little cabin. You know, there's a little cabin back here, and that's where um, Jesus probably was. And they didn't have rudders back then, so they would, they would counteract the sails tendency by using a big bag of weight, big bag of sand, kind of like... We do with our very, we spend, you know, thousands on our truck, and then what we do, we'll go to Menards and buy a $10 bag of sand and throw it in the back. I mean, that is pretty funny when it comes right down. How do we, we got this high-tech stuff and can do everything, but how do we do with the traction in the back, throw a bag of sand? <laughs> well, that's what they did here, too. They had this bag of sand, and, and the idea is that Jesus was back here in this cabin laying on the sand and follow, and then, you know, so he, it would certainly be rocking, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't wake him up. But I did fall asleep and, and woke up in a, uh, a hellacious storm when I was a kid, when I was about 10 in, in Iowa. I mean, I was in a half of water. If you've ever been in a tent that's leaking and the water comes in from both sides and you keep moving to try to find the, the dry spot <laughs> in, <laughs> in the... Um, and uh, I woke up, went out, and the winds are blowing, the rain's coming down, it's just horrible. Everybody's holding on to a tarp, and I'm like, it's just as bad out here as it is in my tent. So I went back to my tent and just fell right back to sleep in the water. <laughs> I had a skill. My wife says I still have that skill. You know, just sit down, fall asleep, boom. All wives say that. That's right. Just, uh, <laughs> all wives say that, Mar says. But the point being is that the, you know, just because it's storming doesn't mean that uh, he's going to be w- w- awakened just from that storm. But the whole point here is that they are with Jesus. And this is probably the, the most, um, our experience as well, let's just say that, that we are Christians, we've been baptized into Christ, we believe in Christ as our Savior, and yet when we run into the Uh, storms of life what do we do we cry out to heaven help us lord we're perishing right and we don't have that idea that well wait a second jesus is with me and so if jesus is with me he's going to bring me through this don't know how he's going to do it just like the disciples i mean what did the disciples think jesus was going to do peter grab that rope there john take that anchor Thought I, you know, is he going to jump up on the deck and start, you know, okay, let's turn this thing into the wind, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> the master sailor, right? Um, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting, and that's the way we, we look at it too, right? We call out to Jesus when we're in trouble. We don't know what he's going to do. We have no clue. And, you know, the, and, the, and the word for us is, should be the same, right? 
Um, hey, I'm with you. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Believe me, since I am with you, you're fine. Since I am with you, you're fine. You know? I am, um, yeah. That's something. It's something uh, tremendous. Because at the time I was on the plane, right, coming back from Colorado, and it was a, it was a, I don't know, it was a 737. It was quite a large plane. It was in the fall, and it was incredibly windy, and the whole flight back was like this. It was like flying in with my brother in a Cessna 152 <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it was like, I mean, and this is a huge plane, and, and it's going like this, and I'm like, no big deal, but you could hear a pin drop the entire flight. Everybody was so scared. They were incredible. There were people crying. This plane was going like, I mean, and I mean, just like the whole flight. And we get into Minneapolis, and it's like this and this and this, and we're coming down like this and this and this, and then it's like, er, awesome. That pilot did an awesome job. I mean, the whole thing he's fighting, and the whole way back, you know, he's fighting, and just, and you know, if you're in a small plane and in any wind, that's what happens. And so as we're walking out, what, what's that? They did. People clapped. <laughs> like, yay! And then I had a collar on because I had done a funeral in Denver, and, and, I, and I was walking out. There was, a, there was the uh, pilot, and he had his tie down, <laughs> you know, and he was standing at the, the door. And uh, I said, hey, awesome job, man. And he's like, well, I'm glad you were here. <laughs> <laughs> but that was an interesting exchange, right? That was me saying, you know, good job, pilot guy. And who knows if he used to fly F-16s or whatever, but I mean, he handled it all the way up from Denver, all the way here. And even though it was windy, he just you know, brought us right in and straightened it out and boom, dropped us in. Awesome job. But then he also acknowledged that I needed help. And, uh, and I just thought it was an interesting exchange. And I flew back from Denver. The girl crossed from me and cried the whole trip. Oh yeah, she flew back from Denver. She cried the whole trip. I was on a plane, another one from uh, Fort Wayne to, to Chicago in the middle of wintertime, and the, the people in the plane, and it was just a little turbulence. I mean, it was just like, you know, nothing much, and they were crying. They were just, they were all crying. I think everybody held hands. You didn't everybody know. held hands on your flight, so it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Did they get worried about the six-foot rule? <laughs> Nobody worried about the six-foot rule back then. It's like we're holding hands, and no, I mean, if you grow up in those little planes, you get knocked around the sky in anything. I mean, and, and, and so you get used to all that movement and all of that. And, and with the bigger planes, of course, you start thinking, oh, it's supposed to just be this nice, smooth, like being on a train or something. No, if they get into storms, they're going to be kicked around the sky just like, uh, just like anything else. So, yeah, <laughs> that's something. Um, so, when we're having troubles in life, uh, instead of thinking, where is Jesus? We think Jesus is here. He's here with us in the boat, in the boat, as we, in Minnesota. He's in our boat. And we should understand that, really. And then, well, yeah, but it's still scary. Yeah, but Jesus is with you. You know, it's one thing to be in a storm all by yourself. It's another thing with your parents right next to you, right? And you're like, well, you look at your parents. When you get in a situation like that, you don't get, if they're not scared, you're not scared, right? You look at your parents. Are they scared? They're not scared. Okay, well, I won't be scared. But if they're scared, you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> you're like, oh, maybe I should be scared. All right, good. So just a couple more minutes here. And um, where is your faith? And notice that they were fearful and amazed. And, you know, this fear of Jesus that he can do this, he's got the power to do this. You know, we have that in the liturgy. With you there is forgiveness. This is taken out of the Psalms. With you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Meaning you have the authority, the power to forgive, and that is legitimate and right and good. So yeah, that must mean you have mega authority and mega power. So, you know, a, a good example here is, uh, you know, when you're working with electricity. You know, electricity does some, uh, does wonderful things. What a wonderful good it is, but you better respect it and you better fear it. Because if you don't, you will get killed. It's as simple as that. You can't be silly with it. You have to abide by the things you need to do. So, 
So, um, we'll, we'll, I think we'll, we'll uh, stop there because we're going to the, uh, the, the account of the, the Gennesaret demoniac, which is a really fascinating account. And uh, we'll pick it up there. So, uh, next week. So, why don't we close with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your word you continue to work within our hearts and souls and minds. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, not to fight against your word, but simply to embrace it and therefore learn who we are and learn that how to be within the world and to rejoice that we can so be within the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm.